Hi, Ami. Can you hear me? Hello. Can, can you hear me? So hi everyone, welcome to this session. So um, it's about small wiki that will be presented by uh, Amir. Amir is online, so I'm going to have him live now. Uh, great, so a quick test. Uh, can anybody hear me? Just let me know that you hear me. Hi Amir, can you hear me? If you can, can we say something? I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Wait a minute, we cannot get you yet. Thank you. Okay. Hello. What can I do? Can, uh, can you please? Can, oh, we can get you now. Can please see it again. Perfect. One, two, three, four, five. We can get you perfectly now. Oh. Okay, hi, great. So, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, Singapore. Uh, I'm talking to you from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I just moved here a few days ago, so it's the middle of the night here, but I'm really, really happy to be there. Um, so, hi, um, I guess that some people uh, know me from, you know, uh, I visited some Wikimedia conferences and some people don't, uh, so uh, it's part of my style. I uh, love languages, I love language diversity, so I uh, love mentioning uh, various languages as I'm speaking, so this is a particular language uh, in which uh, I've been very, about which I've been very curious uh, recently. Uh, in case you haven't yet figured it out, uh, what this text says, you will probably figure it out um, by the end of the presentation. So, uh, my name is Amir, um, and uh, I've been involved in uh, making the world of Wikimedia more diverse in terms of languages for many years. I've been editing uh, since late 2004. Um, I've been involved in all kinds of um, um, language diversity efforts uh, in Constant Wiki in the Language Committee as uh, part of the uh, Wikimedia Foundation staff and so on. I'll mention these things briefly, but Really, this is a somewhat, somewhat personal talk um, that uh, I'm going to, in which I'm going to try to show the history, a brief uh, practical history of how language diversity um, developed in the Wikimedia world uh, since 2006 or so, also like even before that, but 2006 is a key year. Uh, I'll try to explain why. And um, how can we make it even better in the future because we are far from perfect. We are better than a lot of other web platforms, but we can be much better uh, according to our vision. And uh, let's talk about our vision. Uh, you probably know our vision, imagine the world and so on. This vision is never complete. It's by definition incomplete. And the page, if you go to the page on meta.wikimedia.org slash wiki slash vision, that page says that this, this is an aspiration, it's an ambition. Um, we are not sure if we will ever get this, but maybe someday we will get to a world in which every single human being can share in the sum of all knowledge. Now, uh, as I said, I care about languages, so to me, logically, every human being means every language. So what can we do about this? Um, now, before I really, really go on, uh, I need to give some disclaimers um, because they're really important in case, you know, to, to avoid any misunderstandings. So uh, it's, it's just myself. Um, it's based on my experience uh, as a person. Uh, I'm not representing the Wikimedia Foundation or the Language Committee or the ConstantWiki.net administrators or like anybody else. This is me based on my experience of talking to many, many people from lots of countries who are interested in Wikipedia and who speak various languages, uh, and my understanding you know, as an editor myself. Um, another uh, important thing to warn you about is a spoiler, like towards the end, uh, like, it's, it's going to be historical, chronological, but towards the end, uh, I will tell you right away uh, what are the three important things uh, that I'm going to suggest 
um, as the important strategic uh, directions uh, for the future. Um, and these three important priorities for language diversity would be number one, um, making templates global and shareable across wikis. I spoke about this topic many times. Uh, I'm not going to dive deeply into it, but just so you know right away, I, I will mention it toward, towards the end. The second thing is the wiki creation process, which is currently very complicated, but currently creating a wiki in any language is very complicated. And the third thing is uh, a tool for managing missing content. Now, that may be not entirely clear right now, but I will try to get there and uh, I will try to explain my rationale uh, for all the things uh, that I'm um, going to propose. Now, this is written in a language that is very personally important for me. Uh, it's, it's a language that uh, I learned about when I was five years old and uh, learning about it really made me um, fall in love with languages. I, I've been wanting to be a linguist to do something like that since I was five years old, thanks to this particular language. If you know what it is, great. If not, I will tell you later. Uh, so let's speak a little bit about like the very early history of um, language diversity in Wikimedia. And um, let's start from a concept from sociology. Now, I'm not a real sociologist. Uh, I, I have a few sociologist friends. So they told me about this thing called habitus. And as soon as I heard it, I said, oh my God, this describes Wikimedians really well. Uh, we, we are a community. We are described by uh, certain habits, a certain way in which we see the world. In case you haven't noticed it, um, the title of the slide, which is written square bracket, square bracket, habitus, sociology, by habitus, square bracket, square bracket. If you are an experienced Wikipedian uh, listening to this, you probably know that this makes a link to a page called Habitus Sociology, and the link that will appear is just Habitus. If you're not an experienced Wikipedian, or if you are an experienced Wikipedian, but you only edit using the visual editor, then maybe you don't know this. So I explain this. Now, for a lot of experienced Wikipedians, this is how they see the world. Uh, they see the world very frequently through Wikitext, through the Wikisyndex uh, in which articles are written. Uh, another important uh, uh, concept in sociology is community of practice, which is quite related to that other one, the habitus. Um, we are used to doing this. We are used to seeing article histories and, and versions and um, all kinds of tools for editing and so on, the blocking protection and, and, and so on. And I'm going to try to ask this important question, is this the thing by which we really want to define um, our community? I mean, it is an important thing, but it, Wikipedia doesn't exist without this. But um, is this the, the most important thing by which we want to define ourselves? Um, this, this practice of uh, writing articles in, in Wikitext or whatever and checking versions and so on. Maybe there is something else that we should be talking about. Maybe we should ask ourselves, what, what is Wikipedia? Because it's actually quite hard to define what it is. If you think about this, intuitively, when you see a Wikipedia in a language, you can see, okay, yeah, yeah this, is, this is a Wikipedia, uh, it exists. We obviously know that the Wikipedia in the English language exists. It has existed for more than 20 years. Um, I know the Hebrew language, and I know that the Wikipedia in the Hebrew language exists. When I joined the Hebrew Wikipedia in 2005, it had about 30,000 articles. And people were saying, you know, I'm actually... Earlier, I was not sure that the Hebrew Wikipedia actually exists, like it existed physically, but it had very few articles and very few people writing it. And I wasn't sure that we will ever get a real Wikipedia. But now, in 2005, when we have 30,000 uh, articles and when we can have a meetup to which more than 50 people came, we probably have a real encyclopedia, a real uh, functioning website. Now, English and Hebrew are lucky that they have this. Some languages are less lucky. So I am trying to define a Wikipedia. This is, this is my suggestion. It's, it's still a very hard definition. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to try to define Wikipedia as something that needs writers, readers, software, current articles, future articles, and policies. Um, now let's take a look at each of these. And you'll see very soon how this all ties back to 
like languages and big languages and small languages and so on. So who are the writers? Who were the writers in the early history of Wikipedia before 2006? A lot of these people were really um, close in one way or another. Not, not, every, not everybody, definitely, but quite a lot of these people were close to the free software um, world or, or free content, free licensing world. You know, the world of, uh, if you uh, care about uh, brands like Linux and Firefox and uh, Apache and, and Perl and PHP and, you know, technologies like that. And Wikipedia kind of grew out of that world, at least in part. It was inspired by that world of uh, free software and, um, it, and and the concept of um, free content and free culture existed before Wikipedia, but Wikipedia really made it big. So these were a lot of these people. So they were either from the free content side of things and you know the, all the you know free licenses uh, world, or they were uh, software developers. Again, not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Relatively few of them were professional design researchers. Uh, the whole field of design research was quite young back then, 20 years ago. Uh, not a lot of them were social linguists uh, who understood well um, what small languages need. But what uh, happened is that uh, a lot of uh, early Wikipedia readers, they were readers who by that time already knew what encyclopedias are. And um, they used encyclopedias in their languages and they could use internet in their languages so and we are speaking about only the biggest languages um an example, 2000 um the first uh, hebrew news website appeared in 2000 before that big news in the year 2000 before that there was almost no content in the Hebrew language online. So, um, but again, when Wikipedia appeared, okay, Hebrew was maybe usable, began to be usable. Russian was also quite usable, uh, but a lot of languages were not there at all. A lot of languages of the former Soviet Union, for example, I, I was curious about them. Barely anything online 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of like languages of India, barely. Um, so, both the readers and the writers, they were quite far uh, from the smaller and less advantageous uh, languages. Now, what about features? Uh, what did Wikipedia have uh, in the early days? Uh, it was very non-interactive, but these days it's relatively more interactive and, uh, you know, dynamic. But back then, you could read an article, you could edit an article, um, you could have categories, very important thing. Uh, you could have top pages. And again, I'm going back to the sociology uh, aspect of that. Uh, it, that's that's the habitus. That's that's how we define it by editing and uh, and reading um, articles. Now, this is a very frequently uh, forgotten part. But some of the larger languages, not all, definitely, but some of the larger languages actually didn't write everything from scratch. Um, some of the larger languages copied a lot of articles from other older. Uh, encyclopedias. Uh, it was allowed by the license, it was public domain. Uh, Britannica uh, or like old editions of Britannica, old editions of some Russian encyclopedias and so on. Um, and uh, they didn't start from complete zero. Uh, there was something they could start from. And there's also the idea of feature articles. I checked several languages back then and all the languages, uh, definitely English, definitely Hebrew, definitely Russian, definitely Polish, they had some plans for the future, like lists of articles that we should write. Uh, and they had different methods for doing this, but all of them had future articles. Like, we are not stopping now. We, we didn't complete the Wikipedia in our language. We need to write more. Uh, which articles we should write? That's, that's a complex question, but uh, they had plans for the future. And they also, also had policies. Now, there were very few global policies because Wikipedia started just from English and then the English Wikipedia wrote policies for itself. And then other languages wrote policies for themselves, some of which were similar to English, some of which were different. Uh, but uh, essentially none of them were really global. So policies were usually local to each language. Um, and then languages, you know, started coming in. Uh, already in 2001, Catalan, German, Japanese, uh, Russian, French, and so on. And uh, 
First time I saw this in 2004, I thought, oh my God, this is cool. And I intentionally made a screenshot with uh, the old monobook skin. That's what I saw. And as a lover of languages, I said, hmm, that's a cool website for me to join. Um, and initially I wrote only in English. Uh, later I started also writing in Hebrew and Russian. But seeing this, seeing this list of languages, it really inspired me. Uh, this actually looked really cool. And I, I noticed like, Okay, how did Wikipedia grow to so many languages? Now, apparently, some languages were added initially, early, uh, because people who speak these languages asked to add them. Uh, Catalan, German, Russian, French, Japanese, and so on, the, the famous stories. Um, but then there was a certain point when um, the maintainers of the servers just added a lot of languages. Uh, just They took a list of languages and they just created uh, sites in them. Um, it was well-intentioned, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of these languages never really grew. People didn't come there. Unfortunately, uh, it's sad, and we'll get to that a bit later. But that's how a lot of languages initially were created. So the thing is, there were there was demand by two thousand six. By two thousand six, I already was a pretty experienced Wikipedia, uh, and Wikipedia, as you may remember, was growing big time um, in that year. Um, People start, you know, interviewing Wikipedians and uh, writing articles in uh, newspapers about this wonderful website. Um, and this brings us to 2006. Uh, this is a very cool language which I can absolutely not read at all. This is Thai. Um, it's, uh, it has a very curious feature that the whole idea of what are words and sentences and punctuation is completely different from English. Uh, it's a nice challenge, nice technical challenge. Uh, think about this a bit. So. In 2006, things started to change uh, pretty in, in some several important ways for language support. So first, let's again speak about features. There were a lot of new features uh, coming in because there were a lot of new writers. So people needed all kinds of tools, protection and deletion and, and things like that, and blocking um, appeared back then, and um, abuse filter, um, and all these things needed a lot of new user interface and user interface back then was translated using uh, patches people had to write code and submit it to a source code repository and the problem is that source code repositories are for developers for programmers they are not for translators some translators are developers but not everybody so um this is jack goldman uh, famous actor, and back in um, uh, back in uh, the nineties, he made a very nice uh, uh, ad uh, for Apple Macintosh. And based on that, uh, I like talking about uh, Translate Wiki. So Translate Wiki is localization in three easy steps: you read an English message, uh, and then step two, you translate into your language, and step three is that there is no step three. Like as a translator, you. With this process wiki, you didn't need to do anything. Uh, you just need to translate, and that's it. Uh, all the technical work behind the scenes was done almost automatically. Um, and again, we come back to Habitus. It was localization in the wiki, so it was really inviting uh, for people who are experienced with editing Wikipedia to contribute translations uh, to the user interface using another wiki. So. And, and, and the translations were deployed very quickly um, after they were made on Translate Wiki. Um, and then we come to, okay, so how do we add new languages to, to the Wikimedia world? And so initially, apparently, I, I was, I didn't notice it back then, but initially new languages were added on Meta, and then somebody wrote an email. And this is the email. Uh, Brian Weber, one of the best known developers uh, of uh, Wikipedia software. He wrote this email, this very short email that he's going to uh, move new languages from Meta to the incubator. And like, this is it, like, this is the whole thing. This is, this is how the incubator started uh, one evening in 2006. And since then, we have the incubator working pretty much the same way as it did in 2006. Uh, so in case you don't know, in the incubator, um, all the languages are on the same side and every page has this funny code in the title, which shows um, the language code. It's quite inconvenient. Uh, nevertheless, that's what people use. 
Um, and once a language graduates from the incubator, it gets its own domain. Now, what does it mean that it graduates? Um, the people who decide about graduation are called the language committee. I'm a member of the language committee. I was invited there uh, at Wikimania 2010. Um, and the language committee is a group of volunteers. They just examine the incubator. And if the language is real and it has a language code uh, in ISO 639, and it has a certain number of articles, and it has a certain number of uh, uh, writers. These numbers are actually not precisely defined, but the uh, um, language committee tries to do something sensible, uh, then it uh, graduates uh, and becomes a real language, uh, becomes a real domain. And this brings us to the next part. This. Uh, is written in a language uh, that is spoken by uh, the Wikimedian of the year uh, for this year. So let's see what happened in the next decade. Uh, so in the next decade, the Wikimedia Foundation and also Wikimedia Germany started being much more serious about uh, language support and developing it further. So uh, the Wikimedia Foundation started the, the language engineering team. Uh, I was invited there. Also, some people from uh, some other people from the language committee and from Wiki were invited to join the team. And uh, initially, uh, we worked about keyboard support and font support and in universal language selector. Also, improving all all kinds of things in the infrastructure of uh, MediaWiki internationalization. Um, in 2012, the Universal Language Selector really became um, a big thing. Uh, it's a component for selecting a lot of languages from a long list. Um, and um, this also brings us to Wikidata. Now, I was not directly involved in developing Wikidata, but it's important to mention it because it's um, one of the most multilingual pieces of the Wikimedia world. It was developed by Wikimedia Germany. Um, we collaborated with them a lot, like they were one of the first users of the Universal Language Selected. Um, and um, the important thing about Wikidata is that it's shared across all wikis. Uh, so you put the data on Wikidata and then it can be shared everywhere. And even though it's not Wikitext, so we are like stepping away from the habitus, uh, we uh, still like, it's still a wiki. It's, it's a repository that anyone can edit. Um, then um, another thing that uh, the language team did uh, is deploying the translate extension on Wikimedia sites. So um, it became possible to translate the um, uh, all kinds of pages on, especially on Meta and MediaWiki.org and Wikidata. Um, so not Wikipedia articles, but all kinds of pages using the same interface as Constant Wiki. Uh, then there was the Tux project, which uh, made a big upgrade in how Constant Wiki works. Um, uh, in case you don't know, this is how the, the translation interface looks like. So this is both for translating pages on Meta and for translating user interface on Translate Wiki. Um, content translation is a major project. It began in 2014. It is still going on. It is still in development. Um, currently, uh, the team is busy with uh, improving mobile support and adding more uh, adding more machine translation engines, but uh, there were other talks about this uh, at Wikimania, so you're welcome to listen to them. Um, and this brings us closer to the current time, to 2023. Uh, this is written in a language about which I haven't heard uh, before 2020. Um, towards the end of 2020, I heard about it for the first time. Um, and I started helping the people uh, who were involved in writing in this language get to on Wikipedia. Short story, it was successful. Uh, please uh, listen to the talk about this tomorrow, uh, about the TIAP Wikipedia. But basically, we, we, we did all these nice things till now. But what should we do next? Because evidently, what we have is not perfect. So again, another disclaimer. Uh, I tried to make it clear till now, but all of these are just ideas. These are not promises. Uh, I believe that these are important things that we should do uh, in the near future, as soon as possible. But um, it's not like they are official projects with the resources and developers and engineers and designers and all that. I do hope uh, that they will become so. Uh, but at the moment, these are proposals. Um, so templates. Templates are an important part of our habitus. Um, 
Some things about them are great, some things about them are not so great. Um, the most important thing that is not so great about templates is that it's very hard to use one template, uh, to use a template from one language in another language. This is one of the most frequently asked questions. Uh, this is different from extensions, uh, Wikimedia, um, Wiki extensions. Visual editor is the same everywhere. Um, and math formulas are the same everywhere, but info boxes are different. So there are, however, few good things about templates. It's really easy to change templates. Editors can change templates, at least on their own wiki, and that immediately becomes usable. So that's a great thing about templates. The problem is that um, extensions are really hard um, to um, modify, but they are very easy to deploy, and they are very easy to internationalize. Um, and some people say that it's easy to copy templates from one site to another, but this is wrong. Um, I tried it many times, and this is really uh, difficult. Um, it's, it's really tragic because people often copy um, a, a template from one of the larger wikis to their own, and they just get stuck with that, uh, with some old version. So this is not actually easy. So my priority number one for the future is going to be uh, global templates, making templates global and shareable across uh, all wikis. Now, I, I say that templates implement features, and let me give you an example of some features. So musical score. Musical score is implemented by an extension. So you can use musical score. This is a screenshot from a real uh, Wikipedia article. You can use musical score on any um, any side. You can use hieroglyphics on any side. You can use math formulas on any side. Uh, but here you can see two things. You can you see an info box and the map from OpenStreetMap. And the info box is a template, which you cannot use on all the sites, but the map you can use on every site, which gets really complicated. Railway maps, which are very common, you also cannot use them on every site. So, and, and then footnotes and chess, and all these things need to become global. Uh, and I'm ending very soon, I see that people are warning me. Uh, we need to improve the wiki creation process. Um, currently, um, creating wikis is extremely complicated. Uh, the incubator needs to basically go away eventually. We need to allow people to just create wikis um, just uh, quickly, um, shorten, shorten the process of approval. Uh, again, I made a, a very detailed talk about this at the uh, Celtic Knot conference, so you're welcome to uh, look that up. And definitely do watch uh, the presentation about the Tiat Wikipedia tomorrow. Um, adding languages in general, the whole configuration process is currently extremely complicated, it could be automated. And the last thing is future content. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, all the big Wikipedias uh, in the early years, they even though it was early, they already had plans for the future. Now we need a system, a method, to give people an easy way to plan uh, what will they write in the future. Because it, it happens sometimes that wikis are created and then they never grow. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. Because when they are growing initially in the incubator, there's something that nudges them to, to grow and to write articles you need to finish uh, all those important articles and uh, then you will graduate and then what? Um, so we need something, uh, I gave it different names uh, when, I, when I speak about this, but it's all basically the same thing. We need to give people a method to show, okay, these are articles that are still missing in your Wikipedia. Um, so this will give a direction. This is not supposed to tell people, write, all the same things as an English Wikipedia. Absolutely not. It's just a method. It's just something that helps people to show what to do next, how to grow, how to become better than your current state, how to become better than other languages. Competition, some healthy competition is not so bad. Uh, AI may be used there a bit. I know that AI is a big topic now, uh, but it's really mostly supposed to be done by people. It's really supposed to be done by people who know their cultures and know what is needed um, for their uh, cultures. And um, this really brings us to a real equity, to a real future uh, when all the languages can just uh, write what they need 
and um, without thinking about difficult technical problems and uh, just go there and write. And uh, uh, this is the end. And I thank you a lot. Uh, and uh, I'm very easy to reach. Uh, so please uh, reach out to me anytime. Uh, and thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the Kimania. Thank you, Amir.